Good morning. It's good to be with all of you who are here this morning. We appreciate your attendance, your decision to come to worship and serve God as this local church has found a way and an opportunity to do that in a safe way. We're grateful for all those who are here. We are blessed to have you in our attendance. I'd like to begin this morning by mentioning to those who are visiting with us, we certainly typically would always welcome our visitors, but we realize that there's a good number of visitors on the live stream, and we want to acknowledge your attendance and let you know how thankful we are to have you with us. We are introducing our virtual visitor card, and this is going to be for our visitors. Those who are watching online, looking at the live stream now, they'll be able to, to take advantage of this. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you directly to our website, and there's a message page there. You'll, you'll go directly to that we would love to hear from you, and we hope that you'll let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you spiritually. We are disconnected. You're not here in our presence, and yet through this process, by looking at the, the link down there below, you can click on that. Send us a message. Where, where are you? What is it that you're dealing with? How can we help you spiritually? I'd also like to say that I would be thrilled. If there's any visitors with us, I would be thrilled and enjoy the opportunity to have a Bible study through the Zoom platform. You may want to request Bible study materials. You can do that as well in that message box. Let us know what it is you would like to study. We'd be happy to send that to you. We will provide those to you for free, and we would very much appreciate it. It's going to take a second, but we'd very much appreciate for you to fill out our virtual visitor card and let us know how we can serve you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Well, you all know what's happening in this world. You all know what we're up against, the, what we're seeing on the news, what we are hearing each and every day. There is no doubt we are living in strange and unprecedented times. You heard that a lot on television. That's how they all start every conversation. These are unprecedented times. This is unprecedented. We haven't seen this before. We've never done this before. And so we're caught up in the middle of it. But there's a very serious side to it, a very serious reality that people have lost their lives. People have died from this COVID-19 virus. Someone could cough on me at the store. And two days later, I could be surrounded by medical professionals. I could be separated from my friends, my family, and those who I love the most for their safety and their prote protection. I could be separated from everyone I know and love. And it's not just a problem in the United States. The COVID pandemic is a global pandemic. And we know that there's going to be economic consequences from all of this. And so there's a lot of thought there's a lot of concern, there's a lot of fear that is swirling in the air, and as Christians, we want to look at these things with the help of God. We, we want the Lord to be with us in all things, that's how we live our lives, and yet there's this issue happening that's happening in our lives, it's taking over the decisions that we're allowed to make. And so th these, are, these are challenges for us. One thing I've learned about this pandemic is it does not care whether you are rich or you are poor. Both have been equally affected. This pandemic has reached every class in every society, and it is taking lives, and it has taken lives. We know now that world leaders have suffered from COVID-19 and have been hospitalized and, and near, near death. World leaders are catching this and can't be immune to it. They're having to deal with these things as well. And so what are we supposed to do as Christians? What is the plan? It did get here very quickly. These things moved upon us very quickly. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the Word of God with you and see if we can decide a few things about all of this. The question I have been asked frequently by members and those who are outside the church, and the question that I've asked myself is this. What is God doing? Where is He in all of this? Who are the people who are losing their lives, who are sick, or are being plagued by this in a very real, life-changing way. What is God doing? Or maybe the better question is, is this God's judgment? You think about how far this is reached, and the issue is known worldwide. This is a global problem. What part, if any, does the Lord play? I want to share with you this morning that there is no way that I, biblically, scripturally, can answer that in this moment in time. I want to share something else with you. I wish there was a COVID-19 verse in the Bible. 
I wish there was a pandemic passage that we could turn to in the New Testament and say, and the Lord would say to us, when this comes upon you, these are the things I require from you. Boy, wouldn't we do that? Wouldn't we do that? We love Him and we trust Him and we want to turn to that verse and see it and say, okay, now I know what God wants and I'm going to do it because I believe in Him and I have faith in Him. And there's no COVID-19 passage in all of the Bible. But if there was, we would do what God had required of us. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 for just a moment. We're going to set the stage for, for what's happening today. What we can know about the Lord and, and maybe how or how He's not involved in these types of things. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to read just a few passages together. Many of us are familiar with Deuteronomy 28. This is that place where the Lord says to His people, if you do these things, if you keep my statutes and my commandments, I will bless you. I will fill your lives with good things. Your crops will always return to you with plenty of food. Your, your cattle will be fat and you will be blessed in every way. The other side to Deuteronomy 28 is if you do not do these things, if you refuse to keep my commandments and my statutes, I will bring a curse upon you. God says this in a very personal way. I'm bringing it and it's going to be upon you. And so we want to look at Deuteronomy 28, but we also want to remember that this is for the nation of Israel. This is not for the day and age we live in as New Testament Christians or those who are visiting with us and thinking about Christianity and maybe whether or not they should trust in God. Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 15. This is where the Lord begins to announce the curse that will surely come. Deuteronomy 28, 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all of His commandments and His statutes, which I commanded you today, that all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed, cursed shall you be in the country. See the Lord mentioning here, there's no place for you to run and hide if you do not keep my commandments and my statutes. You're going to be cursed in the city. You're going to be cursed in the country. We see a little bit of that in what's happening with us. Look down in verse 19. I want us to take note of the language and the things that the Lord says specifically that He will bring upon His people. This is important for us. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 19. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke, and all that you set your hand to do, until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings, in which you have forsaken Me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until He has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with the sword, with scorching, with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of the land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Now that is the promise of God to the nation of Israel and it's based on, all of this is built and based on their obedience or their disobedience. The passage we have read is about disobedience and sin amongst God's people. And the Lord, if you can tell with me as we read through this, He is very serious about His statutes what He has given to mankind to do, to follow, and to obey. He says, if you do not, and you will be challenged, if you do not, these curses will come upon you. We're going to look at the book of Amos. You can be turning there with me now. As we look at the book of Amos, and as we look at other prophets, when we read through the prophets and consider what the Lord says through them, we're going to find behavior and patterns that are identical. They are the same in many ways. That's important for us as we study this morning. The patterns and the behaviors are the same, both in the people of the earth and the, in God's judgment that is pronounced and completed against them. There is a consistency, and that's what we're watching for this morning. We're trying to see where the Lord is in all of this for us today. Amos chapter 3 
beginning in verse 6. Amos 3 and verse 6. The Lord challenges His people through His prophet by saying, If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there's calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. So that's going to be important for us as well. If this great calamity comes upon the city, the prophet says, has not the Lord done it? Is this not the rebuke that He's brought upon you because of your sin and because of your iniquity? That's the point that is made in the book of Amos. But the second part is, God will share this secret thing with His prophet. In other words, there's going to be a warning. Someone will stand up and say, the Lord is angry with you. The Lord disapproves of this. Repent. Turn back to the Lord. There would be someone who would call out to God's people. And so He makes that clear to them as well. Look over at Amos chapter 4. And now we're going to watch the heart of God. Again, important for us. If there's someone visiting with us and they're considering these things or they want to see this particular lesson later down the road because they're worried about this pandemic, we want you to look at God's heart. Amos chapter 4 and verse 6. God says this, Also, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all of your cities. The Lord did not distribute toothbrushes to His people. They have cleanness of teeth because there's no food. Cleanness of teeth in all of your cities. And lack of bread in all of your places. Yet you have not returned to Me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you. Remember Deuteronomy 28? I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. The Lord mentioned that in Deuteronomy. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water. But they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Think about what God is saying to His people. There was rain in one place. I withheld rain from another. The the place that received no rain got word that there was rain somewhere else and they went to that city before the harvest was complete. God told them He would do this and He told them the way that He would do it. Imagine these people traveling to this other city to go get water or pay for it or hope that there's some left and no one says, you know what's happening? God's involved. I know that because he says, you did not return to me. Imagine walking to another city out of your drought-filled city where everything is withered. You're hoping there's water where you heard there's water and still it hasn't crossed your mind that we've offended God. He's keeping his word that, that, that pertains to our covenant with him. We can't stay here, brethren. We're going to have to turn back to the Lord or we're going to suffer. He says over and over again, you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse 9, remember in Deuteronomy 28, verse 9 says, I blasted you with blight and mildew. That's exactly what he said in Deuteronomy 28. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, the figs of your trees, and your olive trees, the locusts devoured them. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword, along with your captive horses, I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand fire brand plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. We have read it over and over again. The things that he's done, the things that he sets before his people to shock them to shake things up and say, wait a second, where are we in our covenant with our God? Where do I stand personally? How is my home doing in this pandemic, in this plague, or as some of our loved ones perish from the sword? God says over and over again, I did these things to shake you up and to remind you of who I am, and you would not return to me. In the Old Testament, When we see God's judgment poured out on nations and cities and even groups of people, 
there are repeated offenses committed by those who are being judged. Did you hear what I said? When the Lord moves in judgment upon nations, cities, and groups of people, there are consistencies with these groups in the way they're behaving and what they are doing. I am not trying to drag Old Testament prophecy into what's happening to us today, but we can make no mistake about what the Bible says very clearly. Let me share with you some of the consistencies of the people that he judged for their sin. Number one, the shedding of innocent blood. Proverbs chapter 6, in verse 17, God says, I hate the hands that shed innocent blood. We better look around. We are guilty of the deaths of 62 million American babies since 1973. God hates the shedding of innocent blood. What's the judgment for that? What's the price? What, 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 do, you, what do we owe for that when we kill God's children? What is due to us? That's a serious question, and we need to ask it. Number two, num the second thing that I see consistently with nations, people, and groups, even cities that are destroyed, is homosexuality, homosexuality is accepted and embraced. Genesis chapter 19 and verse 5, we see Sodom and Gomorrah. The men of the city came to Lot's house, banged on the door and said, Give us those two men that we may know them carnally. And Lot says, My brethren, do not commit this wicked sin. Judges chapter 19 and verse 22. The men of the city go in to another man who is a Jew. They knock on a door and they say, bring that man out. To the older gentleman who owns that house, bring the visitor out that we might know him carnally. This is the tribe of Benjamin. And if you read through that in Judges chapter 19, you will see that every man is utterly destroyed by the sword because of their wicked act. God will move. We are guilty of these things. The Supreme Court has enforced and supported the right to gay marriage. The lines between genders have been completely marred. There are rules and laws being presented to us every day that get more and more grotesque and wildly inappropriate. That we're going to have to accept the things which God says are not true. What will He do? He reigns heaven and earth. He is on His throne. He sits on his throne and he laughs at nations who scoff at him and who plot and plan against him. Psalm chapter 2. And here we are. The question is, how much iniquity have we mounted up as a people and even globally in the entire world? Many are, are infected and impacted by the Western influence that we present through all forms of media and television and all types of access through the internet, people are learning our ways and we are leading the way to death and destruction. The third thing I see that is always consistent with God's judgment when it is poured out is the people always turn away from God and His Word. Again, the request, the call out to our visitors is a very serious one. The Lord says to His people every time these difficult things arise, you have turned your back on me. You do not know me. You do not understand my word. Every person is responsible to look at his word and to see what's there and to acknowledge what God expects. To live a life of goodness and purity that is upright and cannot be blamed by anyone in the world. God wants us to be good and healthy and wholesome. It's always been a good thing. And so why are we racing the other direction? That's the question we're posing. In Hosea chapter 4, in verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Because you have forgotten the law of God, I also will forget your children. The people of God are destroyed because they don't know God. And He says, You are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And because you've forgotten Me, I am turning My back on you and on your children. How many times do we have to read in the Old Testament how this unfolds in order to, to be warned about these things? We have a record, brothers and sisters, of how God deals with nations in cities in groups who are fully given over to sin. We can see the pattern. We can take note of the things that are associated with nations that are ripe for judgment. 
another important piece to this is someone will stand up and say, we got to hit the brakes here. We've forgotten God. Do you know the books of the Bible? Do you know what the Lord has said about these things, about marriage, about your children, about your life, about attendance at church? Do you know what God says? Do you honor it and do you keep it? He expects you to. We can't continue to, to sweep sin under the rug and assume that he cannot see, neither will he find it out. He is almighty God and we are naked and bare before him. He knows all things. And there's a warning being sent out. We are being shaken. The question is, what's God doing? Is he doing this? Well, I can tell you this as a matter of fact. He's aware of it. The Lord is aware of it and he's permitting it. That I know because he is almighty God and at his word it can be stopped or it can continue. When a people recognize the power of God, His majesty and His glory, and His deep, undying love for mankind, we can always get down on our knees and beg for forgiveness and turn back to God. That's the glory of God. The warning is being sounded now from this pulpit and in many other places. We're in serious trouble. We've got to look at the things that we're getting more and more comfortable with and learning to accept, and we need to evaluate them. Because judgment is coming at the end of our lives. If this is not it, then it's a challenge for us. We're being shaken. Okay, let's think about the things that God has said to us in the past and today. And so we're going to do that. Because I believe that there is this next question. The first one is, you know, what is God doing? Where is He? Well, He's aware and He's allowing it. That much I know. The second question that I want to, to present to you is, is this happening now? We've touched on it a little bit. I've mentioned to you that there's no way for us to know perfectly whether or not this is actually God's judgment upon us or if it's something that he has simply just allowed to take place. But let's, let's do what we should do. Let's look over at Hebrews chapter 13. We'll turn over to the New Testament together. Hebrews chapter 13. And we'll look down in verse 20. And I want to show you something that I think will be encouraging to you. Because again, we've got, enough, we've got enough fear swirling around that you don't need your preacher doing that same thing from the pulpit. What you need is encouragement. You need to know the truth. You need to understand what God has said to each one of us. And you need to apply that in your daily life. We'll be blessed by it. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That passage starts by saying, May the God of peace, who is raised up, we know that He has raised up Jesus Christ, the blood that He shed was for our sins. We are in His family because of what His Son has given on our behalf. But did you take note of what that passage says to us as New Testament Christians? It says to us, God is intimately involved in the lives of His saints. Did you see the wording? He is intimately involved in our lives. Every second of every day. The passage says He is working in you what is well-pleasing in sight. He's working in you. That which He approves of, that's what, what He wants to come out of your life. God, through His Word, is working in you. He's intimately involved in who you are and what's happening right now. It also tells us that He sees us because it says that we might be pleasing in His sight. We cannot be dismayed when someone says, what's God doing? He may have abandoned us. I've been praying and none of this has changed. No, no, that's not what Hebrews says. We are to work out the works of God in our lives because these things are pleasing in His sight. And two things are confirmed. He's working in us. And the second thing is that He sees us. He has to be able to see us in order for these things to be pleasing in His sight. That's encouraging to me. So when all this is, is going on around us and we can settle ourselves down and look at Scripture, there's some good things here for us to think about and consider. Another one I would share with you is 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. 
Peter has warned brethren not to return evil for evil, but to return blessing, knowing that you were called to return a blessing to all those around you. In verse 10, Peter says, For he who would love life and see good days. Boy, don't we need that right now? Isn't that what we want to hear? He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. It's not just what we've seen in 1 Peter where it says, turn away from evil and go and to do good. That, that, that's right. That's exactly right. But there's more to it, brothers and sisters in Christ. Personally, think about your life now, who you are, how you handle these things, not just this pandemic, but before that when things were getting worse and worse and worse and we could see the decay. How did you respond? The Scriptures show us that those who are faithful and love the Lord and have a compassion for God and what He wants to see from this world, that we share in His brokenheartedness. It's not that He sits in heaven brokenhearted that men won't accept Him and we just kind of roll along with the punches. We are to wail and bemoan that which is happening. We're supposed to take these things seriously. Have we wept over these things? Have we wept over the fact that man has lost his way? We should. Let, let me show you a place in, in the book of Ezekiel. If you, look, if you turn over to the prophet of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, I want to show you something, and we'll, we'll just consider this and, and tie it in to where we are and, and what's happening today. Ezekiel chapter 9, the prophet of God is allowed to see things that the rest of the world cannot see. He's God's prophet, and the Lord wants him to know, as, as he's going to go out and, and say these things to the people, the Lord wants him to know why it's happening and how it's happening. So in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3, if you read that with me, it says, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh, and cry over the abominations that are done within it. Well, we've got to take note of that. The Lord has told this angel with the inkhorn at his side, go and find those who are mourning and lamenting the abominations in the city. The wicked acts of the people. Go and find them. That's what we read in verse 4. In verse 5, to the others, he said in my hearing, these would be to the other angels who are present before God, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Imagine such a thing. These messengers of God being sent out to destroy the wicked and sinful city, which is Jerusalem. Down in verse 8. So it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone. This is Ezekiel allowed to see these things. I was left alone. I fell on my face and I cried out and said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel and pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see. And as for me also, my eye will neither spare, nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Watch verse 11 with me. Just then, as Ezekiel is tormented about all of these people being destroyed because of their wickedness and their sin. Just then, the man clothed with linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back and said, I have done as you have commanded me. A prophet of God is allowed to watch the judgment of God being poured out on his own people. There is a servant of the Lord sent out with an inkhorn at his side and God says to him, go and find those who bewail and mourn the abomination. 
not those who have found a way to kind of work alongside it, those who see it for what it is and are appalled at where we've come and who we are today. Mark on their foreheads. So when those come in and slaughter, they will not be touched. Now it would be a mistake to apply this prophecy with New Testament Christians and to say, and I don't want anyone to get the impression that we can't be harmed by COVID-19 because we're faithful. I would never ask a member of the church to tempt God to go out into the public places and to expose yourself in ways that could certainly harm you and may cause you the end of your life. We are to be wise about these things. We are to use discernment. Protect your bodies. Do what is right. This is not Ezekiel chapter 9 happening to us. Many times, and we'll look at this in part two, many times God's people are required to go through the judgment with the wicked. They suffer through. But we can watch them. We can watch their hearts. They are turned to God and they trust in Him. Come what may, we will serve the Lord God with all of our hearts and do our very best to do what is pleasing in His sight. If there's anyone in our number this morning who needs to turn away from their sin, we have, we have looked together at the Scriptures. We have spent a few minutes examining our lives and ourselves. If this needs to be made right, make it right. When the Lord speaks to us, when these things are allowed, and we're nervous and worried, you're putting on a face mask? What's the condition of your soul? That's God's greater concern. Eternity. If you need to make your heart right with God, you can go to Him in prayer. Ask for forgiveness for the one who is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins. Turn away from those things and do what's right. If you've not accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, obeyed the gospel and accepted the Savior of the world, we want you to do that. We want you to come forward. If you're on the live stream, live stream and you want to respond to the gospel, contact a member of the church and you will be told what you must do. Let's stand together and sing a song of encouragement. Let's be thinking about these things seriously. Stands for